Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. This is uh, CPAD's graduate practicum's final presentation for the spring semester. And today we have Bill Rose um, presenting, and I will let him present himself, um, introduce himself. Um, but um, I, I've worked with Bill for many years, I think 18 now, and it's been a pleasure working together and um, collaborating together. So welcome Bill Rose, um, and he will present on understanding by design. Thank you, Anna, and good afternoon. And thanks to all of you for zooming in to this meeting. I do appreciate it. I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, Anna wanted me to just quickly sketch a bit of my background. Um, I've uh, been an instructional designer for 32 years, two years in corporate training sector, and then the last 30 here at Penn State across a, a variety of different units. Um, I first came to Penn State in 1994 and was originally doing interactive multimedia modules to enhance independent learning courses. And then a few years later, uh, the World Campus was born. And so I was part of the noise control uh, graduate uh, certificate program in noise control engineering uh, was part of that team, and my uh, special spe specialization on that was uh, doing collaborative learning at a distance, which was no mean feat in 1998. Um, just a, a couple of other highlights. Um, we uh, developed some uh, uh, regression analysis software and statistics when I was uh, with the Smeal College of Business Administration. And that was used by for many years by undergraduates in, in Smeal College and also by executives in the executive MBA program. Um, I went on to IST and uh, actually did a uh, project for uh, Lockheed Martin for a defense department of defense contract for them, as well as a course in project management. And then uh, in 2006, uh, came to uh, College of Arts and Architecture. And the very first course that I worked on was Introduction to Visual Studies with one Anna Davinsky. Um, and then things really began to change. It was, it was a whole new world. It was uh, studio courses and uh, you know, fully online. It was uh, student artwork. It was evaluating that artwork. It was a lot of video, a lot of media. And uh, I learned something new with every course that I do. Doing film music with Steve Cop Hopkins was a blast. And uh, uh, recently did a uh, uh, large 60 revision with Bon Siegel and Trudy Dixit that uh, was a lot of fun as well. So that's, that is my background. And uh, let me share my screen and uh, see if I can find the right thing. Whoops, and I just got to go into, let me go to PowerPoint and throw that into, sorry. There we go. Let's try that again. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm seeing too many displays. Okay, have we got the screen up? Okay, okay. Sorry, I had my, there we go. Uh, I wanna say that when Anna asked me to do this, I faced a, a decision. Um, I could, uh, I could just speak from personal experience and pass along tips and tricks. And there would have been some value in that, uh, but I felt that I felt that that was too unstructured and too subjective, and I didn't think it provided enough value. I thought it was better to introduce you to a research-informed, proven approach. And that said, this presentation is a bit on the heavy side, a bit dense, and it contains some educational jargon, but not just for jargon's sake. Uh, so please don't feel like you have to retain all of this. If the approach intrigues you, then I've included enough detail to warrant a video playback or a slide deck review. Uh, so I just wanted to say at the outset that this is one part presentation and one part reference. I'll start by introducing the framework and the rationale behind it. 
And as we begin, I'm beginning, I'm imagining that you have uh, questions like the ones you see on the screen. How do I design a course that's highly effective and enjoyable? What process do experienced designers follow and why? And likely many others. These are good questions and they serve to highlight the challenge of course design. After I introduce the framework and then present stage one, I'll stop for a few minutes of Q&A and perhaps you'll have questions of your own. Teaching and learning are complex activities, and so it follows that designing instruction is also. There's so many interrelated decisions a designer must make. In a word, good instructional design is systemic. In fact, the academic discipline is called instructional systems design. I would love to digress into the history and evolution of the field beginning in the 1940s, but time marches on and you're all spared by the clock. Suffice it to say, we're all familiar with a building, the human body, uh, an organization, or a factory functioning as a system. We just aren't used to thinking of instruction that way. The traditional approach to course design is the forward or content-centered approach. You begin by selecting the course content to be covered, whether from your own course outline or a sequence of chapters from a textbook. Then you design the learning activities to help students acquire new knowledge and practice skills related to the specific content. Then you create assessments to determine whether students truly learn. And then finally, you finish by writing learning objectives to connect the content learned to the assessments. So what's wrong with this? Well, there's no destination in view at the outset of this journey. There's no vision of student transformation driving that first step. The first misstep makes the sub subsequent steps potentially off course as well. Too many teachers focus on the teaching first and the learning second. And notice too how the approach jumps to defining teaching inputs without first defining the learning outputs. That is what the student will be capable of. By contrast, the UBD approach to course design is the backward or learner-centered approach. First, set aside what you will do as a teacher Instead, articulate a complete set of desired results you want your students to achieve. Second, continue to set aside what you will do as a teacher and specify the acceptable evidence proving your students have achieved these results. Teaching activities still to the side, plan the sequence of learning experiences that will equip students to learn and demonstrate their understanding. Then, finish by planning your own activities that will guide and coach your students into achievement of the desired results. I'm sure the difference is clear. To quote the authors, in teaching students for understanding, we must grasp the key idea that we are coaches of their ability to play the game of performing with understanding, not tellers of our understanding to them on the sidelines. The UBD framework offers a planning process and structure to guide the design of curriculum, assessment, and instruction. The typical planning scope is a major unit of study within a course, but it can range upwards from there to an entire to encompass an entire curriculum. Its two key ideas are a focus on teaching and assessing for understanding and learning transfer, and the logic of designing curriculum backwards from those ends. The, this idea of learning transfer is the core idea in backward design, so we need to be sure we understand it. Transfer refers to a student's ability to effectively use his existing knowledge and skills in unfamiliar contexts, in contrast to mere recall of knowledge when prompted. Instead, transfer dem demonstrates a capacity to use knowledge creatively, flexibly, fluently, on their own, in realistic tasks and settings. If that still feels sketchy, upcoming examples will make it clear. The framework rests on a very strong foundation. The Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development puts it well. The understanding by design framework is guided by the confluence of evidence from two streams, theoretical research and cognitive psychology and results of student achievement studies. I'm not gonna go through these verbatim as we've already touched on many of them. I'll just highlight a couple of things here. That first tenet is critical. We all want our courses to be the best that they can be. One option is to just go it alone. Simply rely on your own experience and instinct to make the myriad of decisions required. 
Another option is to use a recognized approach for guidance. UBD's strength is that it offers a flexible process without being overly prescriptive. Effective instruction is planned backwards through a three-stage process of identifying the desired results, determining the acceptable evidence, and formulating the learning plan. And I'll walk you through an example of that today. There's a real irony with the word understanding, despite the fact that every teacher continually strives to foster it, teachers themselves often cannot define it. The word itself is ambiguous and complex. We all know what we mean, but just try to define it. One place to start is by distinguishing understanding from knowledge as you see here. Understanding is an equal knowledge. It uses knowledge and operates at a level above it. As the authors state, to understand is to make connections and bind together our knowledge into something that makes sense of things. The word also implies doing, not just a rote mental act. Uh, performance ability lies at the heart of understanding. In their book, the authors point out that the very, the very different, uh, even contrary ways understanding can appear. Sometimes understanding requires personal detachment while at others it requires interaction with other people or ideas. It can be highly abstract and theoretical. Many times it must be grounded in real world experience. Reaching an understanding often requires direct experience. There are different types of understanding, different methods of understanding and conceptual overlap with other educational aims. We can further refine that definition of an understanding to something more precise and useful to us as designers. It works better if we allow ourselves to define it by listing multiple characteristics. An understanding is an important inference drawn from the experience of experts stated as a specific and useful generalization. It refers to transferable big ideas drawn from the experience of experts stated, excuse me, uh, enduring value beyond a specific topic. While obvious to an expert, to a novice pre presents abstract, counterintuitive, and easily misunderstood ideas. It's best acquired inductively, that is, co-constructed by learners who use the ideas in realistic settings and with real-world problems. Here are three examples taken from the study of the visual arts. Think about the student encountering these assertions at the start of a unit. What might they think? What do you mean the artistic process can lead to unforeseen or unpredictable outcomes? Isn't the artist in full control the whole time? Surely she sees the end product clearly and completely. Or how could two equally qualified experts be so far apart in their assessment of artwork? We'll continue to unpack this idea, but even here you can see that a student must experience these truths in order to gain insight into them. To conclude this introduction, this is a truly insightful and useful part of the framework used throughout all three stages. Wiggins and McTighe argue that understanding is not a single goal, but a family of interrelated abilities, six different facets of transfer. And broadly speaking, an education for understanding would deliberately develop them all. A student who understands can explain, that is, can support, justify, generalize, predict, and substantiate. And incidentally, this facet of understanding is developed and assessed more often than any other. Explanation and interpretation are related, but different. Beyond a plausible account, an interpretation deals with personal meaning, storytelling, sense-making, and reevaluation. I won't go into all these now, but you can see that other facets like application and self-knowledge are familiar to us. While others like demonstrating perspective and showing empathy are less familiar as components of understanding. On to stage one. This includes a fair number of elements and requires, requires a bit more time than later stages. What you see here is the first portion of the UBD template. You as the designer are prompted to enter a set of interrelated results you want students to achieve by the end of the unit. Acquisition, meaning, and transfer are a hierarchy, like a pyramid. To succeed, students must first acquire the necessary knowledge and skills to enable them to strive for meaning. Meaning specifies the essential questions students will wrestle with, enabling growth and enduring understandings over time, culminating in transfer. 
Transfer specifies the transfer tasks, the proof of the pudding, where assessment will draw out evidence of deep understanding. Established goals are the related learning objectives, whether uh, design or divine, defined or from a standards body. That's the instructional relationship. In terms of process, this does not have to be linear nor start in a particular place. That said, I struggled to find a starting place in all of this. I'll suggest a sequence that I've noticed other instructional designers use as well. This is the completed stage for a unit in US history dealing with the American Revolution. I'm just showing it to you now for a preview, just to give you a sense of what this looks like in the end. Take a moment to look this over, but we'll see it again in a few minutes. I think the best place to start is with one or more big ideas. Interestingly, uh, Wiggins and McTighe didn't include this component in the template originally, it still isn't included, even though it's vitally important to them and referenced often. Articulating the big ideas certainly kickstarts the process, whether students are made aware of them or not. A big idea is a concept, theme, or issue that gives meaning and connection to discrete facts and skills. A colleague of the authors gave them a great analogy, observing that big ideas serve as the conceptual Velcro that makes knowledge and skill stick together and stick in the mind. Big ideas are essential as a basis for transfer. In a unit of study, students can't learn everything. They need you to set priorities. Big ideas drive those priorities. Here are a few examples. To be clear, big ideas don't need to be huge in scope. Their importance and pedagogical power is what matters, not their size or complexity. And also, they're not basic or fundamental ideas, which are already captured in the foundational knowledge and skills. Big ideas live at the core of the discipline. Take a moment to look over the defining characteristics of big ideas. They all resonate with me, but the first one, that notion of a conceptual lens is especially powerful. Note the third bullet emphasis on expert understanding. While one unit or course isn't gonna make a student an expert, Nevertheless, the student will need to approximate or experience that same learning journey that the, that the expert once went on, just not to the same degree. The expert started out with naive assumptions, with simplistic reasoning, with outright misconceptions and need of correction. Gradually, through refinements and thinking brought on by experience and reflection, the expert's insight was attained. As the authors are fond of saying, you can't tell a student an understanding. Student insights into big ideas require a fair amount of time and effort by means of teacher-led inquiries and reflective student work. Personally, I love these kinds of taxonomies because they really help me brainstorm ideas, in this case, big ideas. No doubt there are others, but these are very common categories of big ideas. As you think about your course, Ask yourself what the most important concepts are or what recurring themes you've encountered. Hotly debated topics should readily spring to mind. You might think of mysteries or paradoxical truths. In short, use whatever will serve to unify and inform student understanding. Okay, so let's say you've been able to articulate a couple of big ideas that drive your unit. What's next? Now we need to transform those big ideas into essential questions. Essential questions are provocative, debatable questions that foster inquiry, understanding, and transfer of learning. I like the way the authors describe them, calling them doorways to understanding. Essential questions can't be answered with finality in a brief sentence, and that's the point. They aim to stimulate thought, provide inquiry, provoke inquiry, and to spark still more thoughtful questions, not just pat answers. Seriously pursuing the question, as opposed to definitively answering it, is the desired aim. So we see some examples from literature. How are stories from different places and times about me? From statistics, to what extent can people accurately predict the future? Across multiple domains, a question like, when error is unavoidable in measurement, what margins of error are tolerable? Comes an interesting question, depending on what fields we're talking about. 
Essential questions are part of the template to encourage designers to avoid a content coverage approach and to commit to genuine inquiry. That is the discussion, reflection, problem solving, research and debate necessary for developing deep understanding. Here you see some of the defining characteristics of essential questions. The emphasis is on genuine inquiry and critical thinking. Similar to the way the six facets described earlier overlap and interact, there are four distinct but overlapping meanings for the term essential questions. They can be essential because they're important questions that recur throughout all of our lives, like what is justice? Or is art a matter of taste or principles? Or they can be essential because they're core ideas and inquiries within a discipline. They're historically important, but still very much alive in the field. Like, what is healthy eating? Is any history capable of escaping the social and personal bias of its writers? Or they can be essential because of the way they help students effectively inquire and make sense. So in what ways does, does light act like a wave? How do the best writers hook and hold their readers? And lastly, they can be essential because they're meant to engage a specific and diverse set of learners, yours. Some questions that are generally considered essential may not be relevant to your students or for your purposes. You've heard a lot about understanding already, so I'm not gonna rehash that here. Instead, let's add, add one practical consideration. In framing your desired results, you'll wanna specify both overarching and topical understandings. The understandings in the first column are more general than their associated topical understandings in the second. Think of the overarching understandings as the transferable insights you eventually seek. The topical understandings on the right are the more immediate, topic-specific insights you hope to cultivate. Imagine that along with the topical Watergate understanding shown, we had two additional uh, related understandings, one dealing with the courage and risk-taking demonstrated by those reporting the story, and the other dealing with the legal consequences that resulted. Students actively working towards those topical understandings will reach a kind of tipping point where they become capable of a broader understanding. Even a president is not above the law. So we continue working backwards. We know that what we want students to be able to transfer and what meanings they need to derive. Now we need to specify the foundational knowledge and skills they need to reach those goals. Knowledge and skill are necessary elements of understanding but not sufficient in and of themselves. The key idea here is enabling. What enabling knowledge, that is facts, concepts, principles, and skills, including processes, procedures, strategies, will students need in order to perform effectively? This is another strength of UBD because it really serves to clarify the scope of course content required. When we have enough knowledge and skill building delineated to allow students to achieve the meaning and transfer goals, then we have an, the right content and enough of it. At the same time, background and other non-essential information may be taught to add context and color, but it isn't emphasized and it isn't assessed. This part of the template doesn't ask what you might expect, a statement of your unit goals. Instead, established goals refer to formal long-term goals at a curriculum level above your unit or course such as related state content standards, academic program goals, or departmental objectives. When long-term goals go out of sight, they, go, they can go out of mind. By including them here, it's easier to see how well your unit or course goals contribute towards them. If you were designing a unit and there were no related higher uh, level goals available, then I would use your course goals. If you were designing a course and there were no established goals to work from, I would omit it. So back to our history example, starting at transfer. Having successfully completed this unit, what transferability does a student possess? It's that given a new and unfamiliar claim about American history and ideals, the student can, without assistance, analyze and evaluate the claim to determine whether it's justified. Look at the understandings. We haven't talked about misconceptions, but anticipating them for exposure and correction is another important idea in UBD. Look at understandings one and three 
And you can see a couple of uh, implied common misconceptions identified for correction. Notice also that the essential questions, a couple of which are provocative. What does it mean to be an American? How revolutionary was the revolution? At a unit level, the content doesn't need to be delineated in detail. It's just a listing, a sketch in one sentence. Many, if not all of the six facets of understanding are, are included. And I like how the knowledge section equips students to uh, demonstrate perspective and display empathy. And finally, the proposed unit aligns well with the established long-term goals. Stage one of this design process appears to be in pretty good shape. Okay, and now, ah, there's my stop share, sorry. That brings us to Q&A. Thank you. Um, I have a question with regards to after this has been designed. So we're designing with the big goal in mind. Do you also tell the students that big goal? Is that like when when you open after you've designed like the, the course or the module or, or the unit, maybe that's a better example. Do you tell them that this is the transferable skill that I want you to do? Is that explicit or is it implied? I would say uh, that it's probably explicit. Um, and this is that kind of funny thing where um, it had a, the, the story behind it had the big ideas thing was a bit evolutionary in that the authors tried to start with uh, essential questions and enduring understandings, and they would hold workshops and people were really struggling to try to come up with that stuff. So they came up with the idea of a big idea as maybe an easier way to kickstart that process. But it's really funny that they don't include it into the template but it really, to me, pretty clearly, uh, it may not be the thing that you open with, that you lead with in the instructional sequence, but yeah, I think it ought to be, you have everything to gain, nothing to lose, and it fits with the approach to make the big ideas um, you know, pretty uh, explicit as well. Certainly you do with the essential questions and the enduring understandings. We get into stage three, we'll see a bit more of that, but but yeah, I, it's a good question. I think that I've, th there's... Um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily lead with it, but I think those big ideas ought to be, you know, front and center. So how are the um, big ideas aligning with the learning objectives? Are they essentially the same thing? Or are they a, like the larger thing above the learning objectives? The kind of a larger thing above the learning objectives. Um, the the I think the essential questions are probably the closest to your learning objectives. In fact, really, you could just about substitute them for learning objectives. They're mm -hmm. almost learning objectives in a in a different form, um, but in a form that students can really kind of they're challenged by and intrigued by, hopefully, and have to wrestle with. The big ideas are. Um, um, I'm trying to think of an example. My mind's going blank. The big ideas are um, more things that, that um, you know, just kind of serve to kickstart the process. So would each module have its own big ideas? Yeah, it, um, it, the way that they're doing units like this, so I'm thinking of your course, you know, um, if I had, say, a four-unit course, uh, there could well be a big idea or two, you know, for each unit. There, there could also be just a larger big idea that we're going for at a course level. The, the, uh, the sweet spot sort of for uh, understanding by design is that unit. Uh, it, it's also really well suited to course design. And as I said earlier, it could go all the way up to curriculum design. The only thing it really can't do is it can't go downwards very well. They actually caution against trying to use it for like lesson planning, where if you're going to say, I'm going to have a class. And the reason is simply that it um, because of the the what it's going for in terms of this deeper understanding, students really need a fair amount of time. They're just not going to be able to acquire those understandings that quickly. So not to say that there are parts of they are useful for maybe lesson planning. Um, we'll see some of that a little bit later on, but it has to be at least a unit, it has the ideas, it has to be probably three to four weeks in length, something approximating that or, or something longer. 
uh, but whole they've had whole school districts, you know, do, redo their entire curriculum. Um, you know, it can range all the way from a unit all the way up through a whole curriculum. Great. Thank you. Anybody all right. Else? Should I dive back in? Go for it. All righty. No. Okay, we're transitioning into stage two, which is determining acceptable evidence of learning and understanding. Note that the focus is still entirely on the learner. For the time being, we will assume that the instructional process is magic. We have, they have magically learned. And so now all that remains is to, is to determine how well they've learned. And don't worry, we'll get rid of the magic in stage three. Here is an especially significant author's quote. Nowhere does the backward design process depart more from conventional practice than at this stage. That's an intriguing statement. Why is this? They stress that our natural, our strong natural instinct, once our instructional, instructional targets have been uh, so well defined in stage one, is to jump straight to teaching activities that students will use to hit those targets. And I would add another, uh, even if a designer does think to plan assessments before teaching, often the test items are created and assignment directions are written without much reference to the goals and without stopping to determine the correct evidence. The author's mantra is to think like an assessor prior to, prior to designing lessons. They acknowledge that this does not come naturally or easily to many teachers. Stage two asks you to compartmentalize, to set aside for the moment your teaching lens and look through the lens of an assessor as if you were assessing someone else's students. Stage two helps us to think like assessors, starting with the first question we must answer. What evidence best shows that students have achieved the desired results from stage one? The key idea here is congruence. In effective assessments, we see a close match between the ability called for in the learning goal and the ability being measured. It sounds so simple uh, that it's almost silly, but a single actual non-example from the book makes the point. A college history professor, professor prepared a final exam consisting entirely of 100 multiple choice and short answer uh, questions for a course in which doing history with primary sources was stressed as an important goal. So hopefully you can see the problem. What we wanna see instead is evidence that's congruent with the verbs and qualifying phrases used in the transfer goals, as well as with implied facets of understanding and intellectual progress with essential questions. I love the author's judicial analogy to inform our assessment mindset. Students are innocent of understanding knowledge and skills until proven guilty by a preponderance of evidence. You wouldn't want to convict a defendant using a single piece of evidence. Similarly, effective assessment is more like a scrapbook of mementos and pictures than a single snapshot, such as a final exam. When assessing for understanding, assess more often and use a mix of types. Notice that in moving from left to right on the continuum, the assessments are moving from simple to complex, from shorter time frames to longer, from decontextualized to authentic contexts, and from highly directive to unstructured. Of course, you'd want to be sure to include at least one performance task for the unit. UBD's theory of understanding contends that contextualized application is the most appropriate means of evoking and assessing understanding. Students need to give authentic performances. To demonstrate transfer, student needs the opportunity to face a fresh challenge. It should be something they've not seen before, uh, yet something they're fully equipped to address. The context is important. It needs to describe a real world context, not merely an academic one. The student will need to determine the nature of the challenge and the relevant knowledge and skills to apply. 
he or she may have to wrestle with constraints, with a messy process, with the need to exercise trade-offs. That last characteristic is not often seen in educational assessment. Like an apprentice learning a trade, the cycle of perform, get feedback, revise, perform, maximizes learning and achievement. GRASPS is a solid approach to the design of performance tasks. Each letter in the acronym corresponds with a task element, goal, role, audience, situation, performance, and standards. This is an example of a performance task in science for assessing understanding of multivariable experimental design. As a scientist with a consumer research group, the student's task is to design an experiment to determine which of four brands of detergent will most effectively remove three different types of stains on cotton fabric. The target audience is the testing department for a consumer research magazine. Students face a two-part challenge. One, to develop an experimental de design for isolating the key variables, and two, to clearly communicate the procedure so that the staff of the testing department can conduct the experiment to determine which cleaner is most effective for each type of stain. Students need to develop a written experimental procedure outlining the steps in sequence. They may include an outline uh, or graphic format to accompany the written description. And finally, the experimental design needs to follow the criteria for good design. Uh, it needs to be accurate and complete. It must appropriately isolate the key variables and it must include a clear and accurate written description of the procedure. Also enable the testing department staff to determine which cleaners are most effective. This is a stage one and stage two example in basic nutrition, only about half of which is shown here. In stage one, we identify that students need to understand that a balanced diet contributes to both physical and mental health, along with three other desired results. We can use the six facets as an assessment bridge to move from the desired results on the far left to the, general, to the generation of the assessment requirements we need on the far right. In the middle column, the six facets, and we see only the first three, have been used to generate a list of evidence, things a student must be able to do. Students will need to explain, interpret, and apply. The brochure they produce will satisfy the first two bullets under explain, and the discussion addresses the third. Each piece of evidence should be captured at least once in the assessment requirements. Once the assessments have been defined, then we need to specify the characteristics and student work that we will evaluate. We're looking to determine the extent to which the desired results were achieved. This is where criteria, rubrics, and exemplars come in. I'm sure you're familiar with the rubrics, so we'll just look at a couple of examples of appropriate criteria. In this example from US history, we wanna measure the degree to which the thesis is supported versus merely recounting the events. We have four levels, levels of performance that while subjective are sufficiently distinct to allow a judgment to be made. This language arts example is even better as there's greater specificity in their performance level descriptions. The one word labels in boldface serve to summarize the level achieved. The measurement statement serves as a reminder to the instructor and students that a competent and well-supported understanding is the focus, not clever or subjective interpretations of, of the reading. So back to our American Revolution example, you can see the GRASPS approach used for both transfer tasks. Evaluative criteria have been identified for both tasks from which rubrics can then be created. Homework assignments and a quiz ensure that students possess the enabling knowledge and skills required. Stage three is planning learning experiences. Stage three consists of two phases of activity, planning for learning and teaching for understanding. Since teaching for understanding is a, a huge topic, we're only gonna look at a couple of key ideas in phase one. In stage three, designers plan the most appropriate lessons and learning activities to address the three different types of goals identified in stage one, acquisition, meaning, and transfer. We need an engaging and effective learning plan. By engaging, we mean a design that's 
that a diverse group of, of learners will find truly thought-provoking, fascinating, and energizing. By effective, we mean that the learning design helps students to become more competent and productive in worthwhile work. Let's expand on our earlier nutrition example. Take another look at the understanding and the evidence we've identified. We need a robust set of learning activities here. To start with, we need to hook them into considering the effects of nutrition on their lives in clever ways. We also need to lead them to understand why the USDA guidelines are framed as they are, the, the underlying rationale, and, and that they're not a sole source of nutritional truth. And just to look at one more, they need opportunities to inquire, analyze, and discuss how eating habits are associated with health and fitness problems. In working with a lot of workshop participants and in reviewing a lot of research, Wiggins and McTighe have identified the factors that consistently characterize, <clears throat> excuse me, instruction that's both effective and efficient. <clears throat> Clear goals are the single most important characteristic uh, participants identify, the one they rank number one. <clears throat> I'll give us a moment to read these, and then we'll see the remainder on the next slide. Interestingly, they note that these answers are given by educators across the educational spectrum from kindergarten teachers to college professors, from first year teachers to veter veteran administrators alike, teachers in art and mathematics, staff from urban public schools and suburban independent schools. Wiggins and McTighe uh, assert that there is a common sense to draw upon in improving our individual and collective curriculum designs. So knowing the general characteristics is great, but how do you best translate those into the learning plan? The acronym WHERE TO captures an excellent approach. It's important to point out that WHERE TO is a designer construct, not the learning sequence, nor is it meant to be rigid for you as a designer. Let's look at it quickly piece by piece. W for where and why. You'll recall that we want a culminating performance task aimed at transfer. Uh, this example is also a fantastic hook. For a unit on the novel Catcher in the Rye, students are informed that they will act as a peer case review committee at the hospital from which Holden is telling his story. Using the novel and other supplied information, students are to write a, a diagnostic report for the hospital and a prescriptive letter to Holden's parents explaining what, if anything, is wrong with Holden. The remaining activities and assignments serve to build the skill set required. H for hook and hole. It's vital to hook the students from the beginning of the unit, uh, from the moment the unit begins, and keep them engaged all the way. We just saw a creative example of this, and the possibilities are many. I like the straightforward example of the town water tower. Students have seen it a thousand times, but have they ever stopped to consider verifying the capacity? This is a personal, immediate connection for them. Thought provocations are great, but beware of being gimmicky. They need to be authentic and lead into the things that stage one is after. E for equip. Not all where to elements are equal. Equipping is the core of the learning plan. I love the story behind that first bullet under explore and experience. At the start of a unit, Fourth graders confronted a completely empty classroom. No desks, no chairs, no anything. Welcome to the first moments of a pilgrim's life. They proceeded to build their own desks and chairs, formed a uh, cooperative to finance their activities, grew and harvested wheat for baking bread, and dyed and spun wool for weaving mats. If they lived to be a hundred, I'll bet they never forget the lesson in empathy or what they learned about pilgrim life. Yes, it's an extreme example. R for rethink, reflect, revise. Given the nature of UBD, students will need planned opportunities to revisit earlier understandings. Students are not gonna be able to master complex ideas and tasks if they only encounter them once. The designer needs to deliberately foster student reflection to enable more nuanced, sophisticated understanding to be developed. 
The main implication is that the flow of the course must be iterative and students must be actively coached into rethinking. E for evaluate. Recall that one of the six facets is self-knowledge, which is arguably the most important facet for lifelong learning. And this aspect of course design is often overlooked. So students will need opportunities to strengthen their ability to self-monitor and adjust to reach their potential. There's so many ways to do this, but I would draw your attention to the highly proven one minute essay, where students take the last minute of class to anonymously answer questions like, what were the three main points you learned? Or what was the most, most confusing idea presented today? T for tailored. Broadly speaking, the content in UBD cannot be personalized because the desired results and the learning pathway to get there are intended for all students. The essential questions though, do provide a good deal of latitude in this in viewpoint. Another option might be to have two or three different choices for the culminating performance assignment. Lastly, O for organized. UBD makes this step easier because we've thought a great deal about the foundational knowledge and skills required, the essential questions and specific understandings sought, et cetera. We know where this design is supposed to go. The three main things here are to think carefully about the learning sequence, plan ahead to intentionally surface and resolve misconceptions, and identify a few points where students need aha moments leading into improved understanding. The American Revolution example for a completed stage three is a good one, but I don't wanna take the time to unpack it. There's great specificity and well-orchestrated activity in what they're calling the entry point to the unit. And you can see from the alignment coding that uh, acquisition and meaning are addressed where you see the A and the M on the left. That thorough foundation leads into later activities where acquisition and meaning are further strengthened. Students are sufficiently equipped and the timing is now right for them to venture a hypothesis as to why America rebelled, reaching up to the transfer level. Now the student performances grow more sophisticated. Note that acquisition and meaning are still being built. The culminating activity is superb. It addresses so many of the considerations that we've laid out previously. I would encourage you all to return to this example later to study it in more detail. I chose the US history example because I thought it really exemplifies UBD well. It's available in the resources I'm about to show you, along with 10 or 12 other good examples from various disciplines. and the resources. Uh, this is the uh, official home of UBD, where Jay McTai has built a comprehensive archive. But the site's easily explored, and you can download the UBD template from there or access collections of essential questions by academic discipline, see more concrete examples of these abstract ideas, get help for assessment design, or learn uh, more, whether by videos or by feature articles. There is a uh, learning personalized site that uh, has a PDF that has the examples uh, linked there as well. Uh, those are all completed units, in all those different areas. That's where US history came from. The University of Alaska Fairbanks has an excellent pedagogical resource site in general. But they also have a number of pages that provide examples and additional exploration of some of the key ideas in understanding by design that you see linked there. You'll also find UBD resources on the Authentic Education site. Authentic Education was founded by the late Grant Wiggins and the organization aimed at school reform at a national level. And that completes the uh, presentation. And now I want to stop sharing and hand it over to Anna. Thought we'd just conclude with two minutes of a video from author Jay McTie. And are you muted perhaps?
curriculum standards or national curriculum or achievement outcomes. Sorry about but that. it's not a simple okay. planning framework. And when people get into it, they realized uh, it, it's not easy necessarily. So my advice accordingly is for teachers to think big, start small, and go for an early win. And by that, I mean, think big. If you like the understanding by design framework, think about maybe two, three years from now that you want most of your teaching planned in this way. But start small. This is hard to do. It's hard to do well. And so don't kill yourself. Start with maybe one or two units a year. If possible, work with a colleague or a team. Try your unit out. Revise it based on how it works and what didn't work. And you will find that in so doing, you'll better understand the process. The next unit you develop will be easier. And over time, it will become a way of thinking. The go for the early win part of my advice is to suggest that as a teacher, don't pick your toughest unit or a brand new one you've never taught or one you really don't like. Pick your favorite, pick a unit that has really worked for you in the past. Use understanding by design to embellish and enhance it. That's an early win, and it's easier to build from that than trying to do too much too soon and just overwhelming yourself. That's now for school leaders, the same maxim applies. Thanks, Anna. Think big. I'm open for questions. Yeah. We uh, we will share all of the resources um, that are part of the presentation, but I'm also putting them in the chat. Sorry, it doesn't look very, oh, I guess it looks pretty good. Uh, when I was pasting it, it didn't look very good. Um, and also we have a very short survey that we would like you to complete um that will help us better understand um, your experience and your recommendations so um i will put that in the chat it's an anonymous qualtrics survey and um i will be sending this out as well for those who will watch this remotely but any um any questions or comments for bill I did have one, but the two minute video answered it. I was going to ask <laughs> um, how how do you assess your assessment when mm -hmm. because this is going to require some courage, um, you know, mentioning the the professor who did the multiple choice, did the short answer that is that's easy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when you change that and that's not working, how do you, is it just apparent because the learning goals haven't been um, uh, gained, uh, achieved? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that it would be, uh, I think it would just uh, be an issue of, of, you know, just kind of evaluating that uh, whatever student uh, performances actually happen. And then having to really reflect on those and go where where are there um, um, you know still any misconceptions cropping up or where are uh, where is it not really quite what I envisioned and um, I don't know that I have a good answer for it other than um, um, and I don't want to put her on the spot but I mean Anna would have had this very thing in the early days of Art Ten Anna you kind of experienced a bit of this right with just you know, seeing work come in and kind of fine tuning, it, it took time. You mean in terms of feedback or in terms of um, uh, learning objectives? I remember like I'm for, for instance, I'm thinking about things like the fact that we didn't really have exemplars in the beginning. Oh, yeah. You know, I, uh, I think any time when you have a new course, everything is new and it becomes richer and experience and as you build on it, then you have more iterations and you have an opportunity to collect student work. I think student work is the most important teaching tool because students need to see examples. If they don't have examples, it's you, you can refer them to various sources, but it's not the same. So yeah, it definitely takes time. Um, you learn what works, what doesn't, and, and then you improve. 
now that I'm rewriting our 10, I'm doing everything completely differently. And, you know, I've learned, I've definitely learned uh, what works and what doesn't. So no more quizzes, no more timed um, quizzes or no quizzes of any kind and more time for development, more time for questions, more time for improving work and kind of um, really delving into the material instead of trying to cover so much ground where all you're doing is like take reading and taking quizzes and writing. It, it, so I, I think I definitely like have such so much better of understanding now from doing all those things and kind of seeing what was wrong and what didn't work well. And, um, but yeah, the examples are always very important and they happen over time. So. Just one quick thing to add to that, because I know we're, we're going a minute or two over time. Um, it does take time. And I think the other thing, interesting thing is I think that you also have to be aware of not jumping too quickly to conclusions because I've I've seen that happen before where something new runs, new course runs, and there's certain some aspect of it that's alarming, you know, the course author, but you don't really know yet that it's necessarily a problem with the course. It it may be something to do with it could be, but it may also be something to do with that particular, you know, group of students. And sometimes it takes running things two, three semesters to see enough of a consistent pattern. You go, okay, now I think I've got a better handle on what really is or isn't an issue. And uh, I think student feedback is another key part in this. You know, uh, you, you maybe don't get a ton of it, as many students as you like to hear back from it, but usually you hear some pretty good, you know, useful feedback that kind of helps you identify what the, you know, what the issues are. And then you just kind of refine it and run it again. So it's kind of that iterative successive approximation idea. Thank you. It was a good question. Anyone else? I don't particularly have any questions, but I do thank you for your presentation. And I know I've been looking through the book and everything and to hear you summarize everything is, is very well done. And bringing your wealth of knowledge to everything is, um, a, a thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate it. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you so much for being here and thank you, Bill, for your presentation. Um, you. It will be shared with the graduate students and anyone else who might be interested, um, but please be sure to complete the survey and um, thank you for being here and have a great weekend. Have a good one. Bye, Bye all. Okay.